on TV, we're used to having that musical introduction, but never quite so sort of Star Wars-y, dramatic. I was. Quite, quite the uh, introduction. Thank you guys so much uh, for being here today. And I, I want to start right off. You know, Amazon, we all know, is a logistics company, a company that can get you things just in time. And over the last 18 months, it feels as though you guys were right there just in time. You know, Heather, you joined just before the pandemic in 2019. And Kim, there you were building up Amazon Care, a virtual primary care service for your workforce. And boom, suddenly you had to have basically a case study on whether you can make all of this work in the pandemic. How was it to suddenly go from a nice Ted Lasso idea to really suddenly have to put some points on the board and win the game? Well, I can start by just saying um, that it was, it felt like really great to have such a strong team in place already. We had uh, healthcare professionals, we had people from uh, building the tech, and when the pandemic happened, a lot of folks from the team just jumped in and started uh, all hands on deck helping. Um, and, uh, you know, Heather and Ben can talk to the broader COVID response, but uh, as far as Amazon Care is concerned, uh, we saw, just like other healthcare systems, saw visits skyrocket. We saw a lot of interest people were really concerned and wanted to stay home. And so this model that we designed worked quite well. Uh, virtual first in the comfort of home. And then when necessary, we were able to send clinicians to patients' homes to help them. So uh, I, my only regret was that we hadn't scaled Amazon Care uh, further by that point, but definitely a lot of learnings. Did you find yourself a little, the system a little bit overwhelmed? Um, our, we actually were really well prepared because we were, it just aligned with open enrollment, which is a time that we were staffing up. Uh, so we were not overwhelmed. I think we were glad to complement the existing healthcare system in the, in the area, um, but we were able to take on the demand and, and really keep that promise of being there for patients on demand when they needed us. And Heather, you'd come from OSHA, so you know a lot about workplace health and safety, but this was a whole different Megillah. Yeah, so just to clarify, I was the chair of the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, so that's like the court that oversees OSHA. But I was new to Amazon, uh, fairly new when the pandemic hit. And I think, you know, to me, you know, health and safety is always uh, top of mind for me, but it was really interesting and made me proud to see how quickly all of Amazon operations moved fast, uh, started taking actions right, a, right away to, to make the health and safety of our employees be the top priority during this time. And that took the, the form of lots of different teams coming together and lots of different leaders stepping up and, and wanting to be a part of the solutions and the measures that we put in place. So robotics, you know, we built labs. Uh, there were just a lot of things that brought different teams together in terms of really focusing on what we could do during this pandemic to keep our employees safe, and the communities in which we operate. You guys built labs at a time when people were just having trouble processing tests. Right, I mean, I think back, I really think that was the inspiration is that there was a point in time uh, where getting testing was difficult and the supplies for that uh, were limited. So we didn't want to take away from testing in the community and at the same time wanted to offer free convenient testing for our employees. So we built two labs, one in the US and one um, uh, overseas and we built these labs in a matter of months and started testing and offering testing free each week to our associates and, and got to tens of thousands of tests being conducted every day and now millions of tests uh, so that we could offer this to our employees but at the same time not take away from testing in the community. Vin, you went from the front lines in hospital to now sort of taking a step back and being in a large employer setting. 
how was that transition and what were some of the things that you found really worked well during the pandemic? I, I appreciate that question. And I, I, first of all, I'll say I've, I've had the chance to work with both Heather and Kristen and uh, you know, having an amazing team of talented subject matter experts, uh, aerosol engineers, people who understand just how to make healthy buildings uh, happen. The reality is just that we talk so much about healthy buildings, what that looks like. We actually have a team, industrial hygiene team, that's making that happen in fulfillment centers across the country. Innovations in air filtration systems, making sure we have large fans, testing to make sure that we have that airflow in place. So we've innovated across the spectrum of what it means to keep a workplace healthy and safe. I'll say that I'm still clinically active as a pulmonologist, and it's been amazing to be at the bedside one day and then to zoom out and work for a company like Amazon when you can build scalable solutions. Whether it's testing, Heather mentioned testing. We have 48 hour turnaround testing with our lab-based PCRs. That's pretty extraordinary. We have innovated. We've worked closely with the FDA on usability studies for rapid point of care technology, which now we've deployed in addition to, of course, other organizations have deployed similar types of, of innovations. We're building a sequencing capability overseas. So we're, we're really delving deep on a tech forward approach to pandemic preparedness. We're trying to make sure that we digitize good information on vaccine, infor uh, on, on vaccine information so that people can access uh, information when they want to in the digital stream, when they want to, when they need to, they can share it out to other people. We're making sure that there's easy access to vaccines on site, testing on site. So there's a, there's a whole host of, a stream of work streams that we've done internally that really positioned us as a public health company. How are you navigating the vaccine situation? I know initially when the supply became available to employers, you held mass vaccination events at, at the work site or, or in, in different communities. Where are you now on that? And how are you navigating the issue of mandating the vaccine? So we're strongly encouraging that our workers get, get the vaccine, but we are not mandating. And we worked really early on with public health authorities and third party and clinicians to be able to provide the vaccines as soon as they became available. Um, and so it differed in different states. But as soon as they became available, we started offering our on-site vaccination events. So we did the on-site testing and then we started doing the on-site vaccination events. And so that really helped uh, in terms of educating our employees, you know, oftentimes with the help of VIN, um, about why we were really encouraging our employees to get vaccinated and to answer any questions that they may have. So we're continuing to explore like how we can educate our employees, encourage them to get vaccinated. So that's really been our model is just doing what we can to make it convenient, easy to access and strongly encourage uh, however we can in terms of education. I I'm curious what the thought process is behind not mandating for workers, given that you do have workers who have to work so close together in, in a warehouse situation. And also just in terms of the fact that we are going there with federal policy, then you will have to mandate workers get the vaccine. Are you finding that you're getting enough people who are getting vaccinated? We, we've seen such a, such a tension in so many large employers. Yeah, so right now, again, we're encouraging with our, our, our approach to uh, educating employees um, to get vaccinated, but not mandating. And obviously we'll look at the, the emergency temporary standard when that comes out, you know, whether it's this week or in the weeks to come. Um, but I suspect that it'll have, again, two avenues, that you are either vaccinated or you have to get the weekly testing. And thanks to our experience with our on-site vaccination events, I think that we're in a good position to be able to offer that weekly um, testing option for those that, again, don't continue or don't choose to get uh, the vaccine. But we'll take a look at the ETS when it comes out. 
Um, I don't think that anybody really knows for sure what's going to be in it. So as soon as it's published, we'll take a look at it and we'll have to figure out how we move forward. We've obviously followed the guidance um, since day one in terms of the CDC and OSHA, and we put a lot of measures in place um, that we were confident about the workplace that we were providing in terms of the measures that we took to keep our employees healthy and safe. And we made over 150 different process changes uh, from social distancing to using our Prexemex, which is a camera system in our buildings, to identify areas where there were opportunities for improvement in social distancing. And each day, sites and leaders would get sort of a, a, a summary of how they were doing. And it would identify areas where there could be opportunities to look at it and make improvements in terms of social distancing. We uh, innovated with a tool we call the Distance Assistant, which is basically a camera and um, a computer screen, screen where employees walk by in high traffic areas like coming out of a break room or the restrooms where you might have kind of that um, tendency to see somebody and want to go up to them and talk to them and forget about social distancing for a moment. So as you walk by the screen, if you have a green circle around you, that means that you're maintaining that six feet social distancing. If it turns red, that's a real-time reminder to you that you're not uh, and to, to create that six, six feet. So we're, we're really confident about taking all of the measures that uh, were in guidance and, and usually ahead of that type of uh, recommendation of even appearing in guidance. So because of that, um, you know, I think that we, we decided that our approach would be to, again, just strongly encourage um, the vaccines. And Vin's been great. Like, he can talk about his work that he's done to get out and to really help us um, drive up that take number. Sure, no, I'll just add uh, to, to Heather's comments that direct engagement has been something that we've been really trying to innovate on. I mean, I think we can all agree that communication, misinformation, confusing messages uh, from the highest levels have been ripe. Uh, and, and our associates share the same concerns as my patients do. They just have questions, the ones that have yet to get vaccinated. So we've been trying to scale direct engagement, literally at the warehouse level, answering questions, trying to scale that. Uh, Kristen Samson Care Team is helping us to scale that approach as well. And then again, trying to see if we can digitally provide this information in, in, in a scalable way across the world. So that's been helpful. And our vaccine rates have been tracking what we've been seeing publicly. So we are making a lot of progress. One of the things I find interesting about this era is that companies like yours have had to really handle care and often at the work site. But you were already moving in that direction. It used to be companies sort of said, let's go out, we'll get a payer. Then they decided they were going to pay themselves, be self-insured, and now they're taking much more ownership of the actual delivery of care and coordination of care for their workers. One of the things that Amazon has done is opened community centers. So it's not even just your workers on site, but with Crossover Health, you've, you've opened these centers. What are some of the things that you were finding from taking that kind of more active approach for your workers? Well, I think there's a real, uh, you know, hunger for that kind of well-being content. So it's been really well received by our employees. And so that's great to see. And those were things that we had already started right. working on before the pandemic. So we had started launching what we call our neighborhood health centers. There are 17 of them across the country right now. And the idea was to put these, these clinics close to where our FCs are and make them convenient in terms of hours and uh, really short wait times. Like I think it's Typically, 96% uh, of the time, the wait time is less than five minutes when you go into one of these. Um, so we just wanted to make the, the access to care more uh, convenient and a great experience. So that's one example of how we've really thought about um, the care that we're providing to our employees. But I think that in addition to that, we think about well-being, you know, more than like a broader view of just total uh, worker health and well-being. And I think that's something that we were already moving towards, but you know that kind of content, especially when it comes to like uh, mindfulness and mental health, like the pandemic has really shown us um, that that's even more front and center. So we had developed a program before the pandemic called Working Well, and there's different components to it. It um, has one component that's huddles. So associates are brought off 
uh, from their workstation to engage with a, a manager and to talk about different topics from nutrition to stretching. Um, oftentimes they watch videos, mindfulness, and it really kind of engages with associates on a topic each month. And, and, then it, and have you found that you've actually changed outcomes? Yeah. I would imagine a lot of people have chronic conditions, and I would imagine for Amazon in particular, there are going to be musculoskeletal issues you know, exactly. back problems, yeah. shoulder problems. You nailed problems. it. Like that's, that for Amazon is our biggest cause of injury, injuries is MSDs. And so this program has been really great at showing us results. So because of the pilot and the results we saw in particular in that area, we've scaled it to the point now that it's at 1,200 sites um, in the U.S., North America, and Europe. So we've seen really great results from that. Uh, but we also have learned from some of the uh, employee feedback on the content that they also like things like the mindful content. So we developed another part of this program that's called Mind and Body Moments, where when employees are at their workstations, once an hour they're given a prompt uh, for a 30 second micro break. Real short, but it gives them that moment to either do stretching or a mindful activity. And that we've seen great results from too. And then a third part is our Amazon component, which are these um, kiosks where employees can go in for just moments and engage in mindful activities. They can do deep breathing, they can listen um, to a tape, a video. Uh, there are resources in there where they can just for a few moments have that respite. So we've seen really re great results from that and now we're taking it a step further and thinking about how we can use this content in an app that's available to our employees and to their families um, because this content is great not just for being at work but for your life outside of work and your well-being for you and your family as well. So when you say results, Vin, are you seeing you know, comorbidities go down? Are you seeing having an impact whether it's on diabetes or heart disease or obesity? So my focus has been on, on COVID specifically. I will say that um, in, in Kristen's actually leading an effort at, at CARE that's looking at trends over time. Um, and, and so I, I would love to defer to her on what she's saying for our corporate population. I'll say just briefly, um, what we, safety measures, uh, the, the frequency of MSK injuries have gone down with all the interventions that Heather has, has enumerated. Uh, and certainly in terms of just actual site, I, I look at data week over week about what's happening with communicable disease transmission in our, in our workplaces that now we are defining as the gold standard for a healthy building. And we're just not really seeing any evidence of that. Where all these mitigation measures that we're putting in place that are tech forward are really working. So Kim, that's something that you're working on and virtual care. Yep. And it's not just for Amazon that you're working That's on. right. So Amazon Care is currently available uh, to Amazon employees, but other companies' workforces as well. And to your point, uh, this is a, a keen area of focus. Employers want to retain their talent. They're very invested in the health and safety, um, but absolutely, we're also looking at outcomes. And uh, we want to make sure that the services that we provide are improving the health, but then also eventually lowering costs. So it's a keen area of interest for the business. Uh, it's of keen interest for employers. Um, and so we're excited. We, we also, I think we're all Amazonians looking at data week over week. We're looking at reasons for biz visits. We're looking at opportunities uh, to improve the care that we're delivering. It's a tough market, though. I mean, it, right now, everyone's talking about it. It's sort of, you know, yep. for 10 years, we've been talking about how telehealth can really yeah. help in this way, and yet it took the pandemic for it to really go yeah. at scale and for people to right. really buy in all of a sudden. Yeah. So it's not just you, obviously. You've got teledocs. You've got uh, what is now uh, included care, formerly Grand Rounds Doctors on Demand. Mm -hmm. United Health just talked about a, a program for employers yeah. yesterday. How do you stand out, and what makes the Amazon Care mm -hmm. service different? 
Um, I would say there's a few things. Of course, I have to call out our patient-centered focus, which is just inherent how we as Amazon uh, approach and deliver a service and design it, really working backwards from the patient. So um, that that's at the heart of everything that we do, making experiences easy and friction-free and super convenient for our patients. Um, it, it's always top of mind and our starting point. I think the other thing that I would call out is um, our in-person service is the ability then when a virtual visit, if that's the starting point, but we're not able to solve the issue virtually, we can bring the care directly to the patient in the home or wherever they might be. Um, and in doing that, we're really building their trust that we're gonna solve whatever problem they have. Uh, and so I think it gives them the confidence to actually start virtual and know that we will take them through that entire journey um, and, and deliver great care. So I think that's a really big part of it. Um, and like I said, just always working back from what their needs, what the customer need is, what the patient need is, um, and then constantly improving, learning from our customers. We also look at voice of customer, uh, you know, hundreds of surveys every week. We're, we're looking, um, and we don't pat ourselves on the back for a job well done. Our, our customer satisfaction is really high, and we're and what very- are, what's the one thing they like the most? Gosh, um, well, I, I would say that I have to give a nod to the clinical team. Care Medical is uh, the provider of clinical care, and they are bar raising clinicians. Um, we constantly hear in the voice of customer how great so and so was. They took their time, they really took the time to get to know me and what my concerns were. Um, and it surprised me, we market certain services, but customers trust us and come to us with questions. And um, we sometimes refer to it as health assurance. They just need to know, is this okay? Is this something um, that I should have checked out? So we're there for them and they really trust the, the clinicians that they're seeing. What's the challenge in scaling the business right now? Well, we're, uh, we're rolling out the service to more and more folks and, uh, and learning as we go. Um, you know, I think that what we're proud of is as we're scaling that our customer satisfaction has remained high. That has been one of those primary areas of focus is that as you scale, you wanna make sure that that service that we were piloting in the greater Seattle area is still uh, really solid in, in terms of our CSAT and all of the quality and other metrics that we're looking at. Uh, we're live with our in-person service now in um, HQ2, so the DC, Baltimore, Arlington, Virginia area. And uh, so really happy to see that we've replicated and have additional cities rolling out uh, this year. So. We're, what are uh, some of the areas that you think you'll be rolling out in? Um, well, I can say the, uh, the areas, the cities will be uh, rolling out Dallas, uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, LA. Those are just to name a few. So um, yeah, we're, we're excited to continue uh, bringing care to, to more and more Amazonians and other companies as well. I heard someone say uh, last week that you know, these days, people want to have all of it. They don't just want the virtual. They don't just want the family health clinic. They want it together. And I, I think about Amazon basically being innovative in that you need to solve for your one million employees, and then it can become a business in the way that you've done with Amazon Care. Do you think about blending some of this? Is that something that you're looking to longer term, being able to do that? That would really make Amazon a healthcare company. Well, I can say for Amazon Care, uh, we have found that being able to take a customer through that journey uh, virtually and then in person and it's seamless and friction free is a, is a winning combination. Um, but I think you're right, patients, are losing patients. They have very high standards 
and they expect a lot from us, and they're asking us to do more. We're hearing that from a um, clinical services standpoint. They really wanted primary care, uh, so we're doing that. Um, I think we're hearing they want more self-serve, and so we're building that. In uh, what way do they mean self-serve? In, in terms of I want to be able to, um, a good example is uh, the COVID test. They want to be able, they don't want to have to interface. They just want to schedule it, show up, get the results. Uh, they want to be able to self-schedule an in-person care visit as well. So there are, are these different um, signals that we're, we're picking up. And then, um, and then you brought up the clinics. Certainly, we see it as there's different on-ramps. And it's our job to listen to that customer wherever they start and then make that journey seamless and excellent and deliver really high quality care no matter what their starting point is. So I agree with you. I think the bar is really high and uh, it, it's on all of us to, to give patients what they're asking for. I, I was, just to add, um, What's, what's interesting at this moment is we've leveraged our logistics operation already combined with the innovations on testing that we've developed over the last 20 months to do middle and last mile healthcare delivery. So if we think about what the future of pandemic response is, it's public-private partnerships. There was a Seattle Coronavirus Assessment Network where basically on demand through a third-party app, you could say, I want a test because I have these symptoms. Within two hours, an AMZL driver is delivering you a test, sending it back in this case, the University of Washington, but that is a model that's scalable, but it requires public-private partnerships. And that's leveraging what we're good at, which is delivering things at home. But you can imagine that's being expanded out to many more other services that have been developed throughout the course of this pandemic. So this pandemic has been an accelerator. And is that scalable right now? Because we hear so many supply chain issues. And, you know, well, when you build it internally. We, we, have, we have swabs now, but I remember at the beginning, we couldn't get enough tests because we didn't have enough swabs. I, I, I'll say a lot of this is, uh, some of this is supply chain dependent, absolutely, but we are building a lot of these in, uh, work streams and initiatives, connected devices, different types of tests that are swab agnostic, so you can just spit into a cup, hopefully. Um, I mean, these are the types of innovations that us and others are looking at, and then uh, hopefully are gonna be uh, allow us to be supply chain agnostic in the future so we're not as dependent on things like swabs and culture medium. And as we are looking towards the fall, we're all trying to get to that point where we're beyond this pandemic, but we're already seeing high flu levels because we're all more out and about. Where do you see things headed with all of the COVID protocols and protections and, and processes that you're in. What inning are we in on that? I, what's 2022 going to look like? Uh, you know, I'll say as, as, as somebody that's, that speaks to patients, speaks to our workforce on these issues, that I think we have to practice vigilance for the next five months. That uh, the fact that we saw, my wife's a pediatrician and she was saying at Seattle Children's there was a spike in kids flu, RSV, in July. So when we think about the hygiene hypothesis and us keeping our kiddos at home for 16 months, now there's a spike of, of admissions because of RSV in July. That worries me about what, the, what December to February is gonna look like. So since we're in charge for keeping our workers healthy and safe, our families healthy and safe, I think vigilance is gonna be the word until at least the end of March. And then I think we're gonna emerge. And if hopefully we get the vaccine approved for children, here in the next month or two. I know that there are some companies that have done family vaccine clinics because their patients just have trouble getting their kids to the pediatrician sometimes. So for that 12 and older group, is that something that you guys would consider, especially as we're talking about younger children? We were already doing on-site vaccination events that were open not just to our employees, but to their family members. Um, so I'm sure Vin can speak to as we see children being more eligible that they will likely be included as well. A absolutely. Uh, and dependents are more than welcome at, at our sites. We have enough supply to make that a case. Frankly, we think that that's going to be useful when we're directly addressing issues like hesitancy. Often it's not just one person, it's the entire family that has questions. So we, we really try to make this as inclusive as possible. 
We have mobile vans. We've been partnering with local county officials when we get asked to go into rural exurban counties to deliver through mobile vans and clinics uh, vaccine supply wherever it's necessary, mass vac sites, you name it. So we have a playbook. And are you seeing people coming in still for first time, or are you seeing more people now starting to come back for boosters? It seems some of the data seems that a lot of the recent recent uh, shots and vaccinations that we've seen are actually for people coming for boosters. I would say right now we're still uh, doing initial series because much of our workforce, at, our, our, it depends on how you define frontline. Everybody in our workforce is, uh, once they're eligible, we will make our contingent uh, contractors, we work with third party clinical groups. Once they say it's okay for an Amazon warehouse worker to get the Moderna shot, which is, I think those approvals are in process right now with CDC and FDA, we'll make it available. But we're not making those decisions. We're enabling success, but we're not making those decisions. Those are what are contingent workers and their policies and procedures, what they will and will not allow. I wish we had a crystal ball, but I think the vigilance piece is important and then maintaining flexibility. So uh, keeping the education, answering questions, availability of testing, directing uh, our, our customers, our patients to those resources, providing some of those resources ourselves um, is going to be really key to get through this. So fingers crossed. Yeah, I, um, I think I stopped trying to predict when we might be <laughs> out of this. Uh, but I think, you know, we just need to keep meeting every day, continuing to look at the data, continuing to look at the science. And I hope that Vin is right that uh, there's a path forward in about five months. Is your data showing you've, you've really lowered transmission at this point, or are you still seeing some breakthrough cases? I, uh, we're track. We're looking at data as it comes in. I would say that um, we're certainly tracking what we're seeing in communities, if not much lower in most cases. And so um, it, it just goes to show that strong mitigation measures with strong communication works. If you had to think about what has come out of this experience over the last 18 months that carries forward. I wonder how it shapes your view of trying to deal with things like comorbidities, things like chronic conditions that are so prevalent in the American work workforce. As you look at your workforce, how are you taking this process and this engagement process and moving that forward to deal with those issues? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of new relationships and learnings that will continue to service well as we move forward. Like I said, I'm a health and safety professional, so it's always been my work. But um, I think, you know, from this experience, one of the experiences that I've seen is that more people are focused on the health part of health and safety. And I think we're going to continue to have that emphasis on the health side of the health and safety. It's all part of, you know, um, the well-being of our associates, and, and I'm seeing that ownership of that at all levels across not just our company, but, you know, other employers as well. I think about that with your company because you have so many sort of health efforts that often don't seem like they work together. You know, the Amazon Alexa folks just talked about having caregiver assistance, which seems like it would work really well with Amazon Care. We, so at Amazon, we really focus on ideas and then work back from the customer. So you bring up some other initiatives. Uh, Amazon Care is one effort. Uh, Amazon Pharmacy is another, Amazon Halo. Uh, we're all in the same space, but the way we work back from a customer uh, may mean that those points of interface may happen later in the roadmap. It's hard to speculate. We'll just stay focused on what customers are asking us to do. Uh, and when the time is right, then, then that's when we, we make sure that those points of connection are seamless. Well, our time is up. And of course, we could keep talking forever. But I thank you very much for sharing your vision this afternoon. I really thank, you. It. thank you. Thank you.